children. You'll need to be the kids to take them. Mm -hmm. On the big kids' side. But then I went to hear last Sunday, I'm really struck by how much uh, the folk of Lachalshire are working on their tan at the moment. Uh, everyone has a good degree learner than ever, uh, ever was when I was last year on Sunday morning two weeks ago. So probably I have two perhaps, I don't know. Anyway, it's good to be here and good to join with you in the worship of our living and glorious God and His Son, our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. So we're going to begin with the Psalter version of Psalm 145 and we're, oops, let's sing Psalms. Tomorrow. Oh, so I'll sing the songs. Uh, and uh, who's ready? Who's ready? Who's ready? Are no. oh, you ready? I'll just give you a minute to get you. Um, did you have a sing song? No, I don't think. Did it solve it? Aye, that's alright. It's okay. I'll just give you a minute. You got a tune? Yeah, yeah. Just give me a minute. Right, I'll give the notices. That's what I'll do. I'll give the time. Okay, so um, tonight's service here at half five, and uh, we'll start with a short time of worship. We're going to watch together the address that Dr. Bob Ackroyd gave uh, as the moderator of the General Assembly uh, last Monday, uh, last Tuesday morning. A great address. Uh, of course, we have a soft spot for Bob because a long time ago uh, he was a student on placement in our congregation, and. Uh, Every time I see him, he says, Ronnie, he taught me everything I know, he says. Which uh, absolutely is not true. <laughs> but, uh, and, and you'll see that since Bob opens his mouth and into a thing. He knows a lot more than I do. Uh, but Bob is going to uh, uh, speak to us through, through the address uh, this evening. So that will be something to look forward to. Hope we can make it along for that. Um, the return collection for June is for the buildings for the fabric fund. <coughs> uh, and, uh, yeah. Tomorrow, uh, sadly, we have a funeral of the oldest member in, in the community, I think, in Kyle here. And uh, an example to us all in terms of managing to get the church right into in his mid 90s, Duncan Mackay uh, of Falcher in Kyle. So Duncan's funeral is at 2 o'clock here tomorrow. Afternoon. Okay. Uh, Wednesday night, our midweek meeting, time of fellowship, and we had a discussion two weeks ago about planning for the rest of the year, and we've got lots of ideas, so I'm going to try and bring that forward this week uh, and conclude the discussion with some concrete plans. So that's on Wednesday night at half seven, all welcome, time of prayer as well. Uh, Friday, the Old Brook Cafe. And next Sunday it's half ten here in the morning and half five in Kailaka. And then a week on Saturday is the congregation lighting. Now we sometimes call it Sunday school lighting, but we want to feel that everyone can come. <coughs> We're going up to the beach in Europe and hope this, uh, well, in some ways I hope this long uh, sunny spell lasts till a week Saturday. And in other ways, if anyone's looking at uh, the dry ground and whatnot, you might not be want, you might be want some rain. But in any case, uh, we do a Saturday, we run together off to the beach. If you like to come, it's for everyone, uh, for our kids, but also for everyone. If you like to come, then uh, do let one of the Sunday school teachers know just for our <coughs> transport. If you like to donate anything to make the uh, outing uh, uh, even better in terms of baking and anything like that, then please again speak to the Sunday school teachers. Okay. Right, so let's begin our worship. We're going to sing from Psalm 145, the words uh, on the speed. <coughs>
I'm not going to do the kids' dress. Okay? Just, uh, it's not like, I'm not thinking, like, there's no point wasting it on these guys. It's not like I'm thinking that. Okay? It's just, uh, kind of needs kids. This one. Okay? So, uh, I'll do it. Probably next week, actually. Do it next week. But it's about Mary's anointing of Jesus, actually, which is what we're going to think about yeah, as, as grown ups as well. So, what we're going to do now. We'll just move on and we'll pray together. So let's let's pray. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, as we uh, remember that we are in your presence here, uh, you know, Lord, you have a disappointment in our hearts as we love to have the children with us. And Heavenly Father, we do pray for each one of them. We ask for your, your grace in their lives. Uh, and we pray, Lord, for uh, the work of your Holy Spirit uh, to take place in the lives of the children who attend the congregation here. Also, Lord, the children who are in our community, uh, who are in different uh, uh, primary schools. And we pray your blessing, Lord, on Timmy. Uh, especially as he goes in to take assemblies in, in the schools and in the high school. And we pray, Father, for the ministry that he has there um, to young people like on Friday afternoons in the village hall here individually with uh, young people as they um, go out perhaps uh, for support of walks with him uh, or for activities. Uh, and we pray for all those who volunteer helping in this uh, work. We pray for other clubs and other groups catering for young people and children. And we do ask, Heavenly Father, that you'll particularly uh, hold our, our young people in your heart, Lord, in a very merciful way, Lord, so that they uh, may uh, not grow up ignorant of you. Uh, and. Uh, and not only grow up knowing a little bit about you, but that they may grow up actually receiving you and trusting you personally. Heavenly Father, we need a whole new generation of people who have come to realize that Jesus Christ is Lord and that he is risen and that he is a wonderful Savior and that he puts us into your family and that he is going to be with us forever more. He is our great reward. He is our hope. He is our future, our hope and our glory. So Heavenly Father, please come now and uh, minister to our hearts uh, because Heavenly Father, we come this morning, we need uh, orientation, we need encouragement. And uh, Lord, our lives are just often like, uh, just like twice uh, going down a, a rushing stream and there's uh, times when they're just moving too quickly and times when they're caught in the eddies at the sign uh, times Lord when, when we're, we're chaotic times Lord when we, we uh, um, just don't know where life is going and we look at our world and we wonder and uh, perhaps even we're, we're apprehensive or afraid Father in heaven we remember that it's all in your hands. We remember that you're sovereign, that you're our Savior, and that you're our God. We praise you this morning, Lord, as we've done so already in the psalm, that you uh, are the Lord who is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in love and faithfulness. Thank you for your character. Thank you that you're good, that uh, you're the Lord, that you're Lord in a, in a sense that it's always good for us. You always want truth, you always want justice and fairness in our, in our world, and you always want grace and mercy. And Heavenly Father, uh, your judgments are a last resort uh, in order to free those who seek to walk with you so that they can continue to do so. So Heavenly Father, we, we come to you and we worship you. We come and seek you. We come, Lord, and exalt you. We pray you'll lift us high this morning in, in visions of, of your glory and of your love. And we pray, Father, that we will be encouraged this morning, greatly, in our lives. 
whatever we're dealing with uh, in our lives, whatever issue, whatever challenge in our homes and our families, uh, with our health, with our work, uh, and just dealing with the complexity of society today, Lord, help us and give us your grace and your guidance and forgive our sins, our living God. We pray, Lord, for your comfort in the community and we especially do remember uh, Duncan's sister, uh, Margaret, her family, Ian and his family and uh, wider family and uh, neighbours and friends uh, so precious to Duncan. We thank you, Lord, for the way that he was uh, supported so well. We ask you your care and your mercy with each one of them. And uh, we do pray for the elderly, Lord, in our community too. And uh, remember, Lord, uh, challenges that uh, being older brings to us. We pray, Father, for those who are losing things that uh, they've had, whether it's hearing or eyesight or memory or strength, coordination, uh, uh, balance, whatever it is. Loving God, please come alongside us and uh, please help us, Lord, to trust you and to know, Father, that there is one thing that can never, ever be taken away, and that is uh, our connection to you. Uh, even, Lord, if we are faithless, you remain faithful. Even if we have forgotten our old names, uh, you remain faithful. Uh, you will never, ever let one of your children go. And, Father, thank you for the resurrection which brings a whole new body and a whole new uh, strength and presence of mind and ability uh, which we look forward to in Jesus Christ. Uh, Father in heaven, we pray for the country, we pray for the world, we pray, Lord, for your mercy. There are so many tragic places still in Ukraine, Lord, the site of that uh, terrible train accident in India. And Father, many, many natural and man-made disasters uh, that uh, are taking place all around the world. We pray for refugees. We pray, Heavenly Father, for grace in their lives uh, to just give them a place they can call their own again. We pray, Father, for, for those living in fear, for those who are experiencing abuse of all kinds. Father, please help them to escape and turn their abusers uh, to repent to better ways. Heavenly Father, we pray uh, for the church, we pray for the persecuted church, we pray for those who are persecuted in places like India, uh, Afghanistan, uh, Nigeria, Father, North Korea, we, China, we just remember these, uh, these uh, vast numbers of Christians, hundreds of millions, Father, and uh, pray that you will help them to remain faithful because we know, Lord, it's not in you giving us an easy life that the church prospers, but it's rather in our faithfulness in the face of trials. So, Father, please uh, build out your church across the world. Make it a beacon of light uh, in a world of confusion and darkness. Help us to walk with you and help us to love you. And may you continue with us now. Help us to worship. Help us to exalt you. And praise you, help us to walk with you, and help us to be faithful to you in the week ahead, to take the opportunities that you give us, and uh, to show uh, our love for Jesus, and to speak about that love and about him. And Father, if there's anyone in our hearts just now that's particularly of concern, anyone we just long to see turning to you, Lord, again we pray for encouragement. We pray for the joy of seeing people actually getting to the bottom of the empty barrel that they've been trying to get life out of and they're at the bottom uh, seeing perhaps uh, uh, the gospel where uh, it's always in a place where we need it and Father turn to you have mercy pour out your grace now and receive us for Jesus sake <coughs> We're going to sing now the children's uh, 
quarters. But this is what we want to do. So let's let's start and let's sing. We want to see Jesus. <coughs> Passover, Jesus arrived at Bethany, so he's coming back really to the place of great danger where the Jewish ruling council, the government in Jerusalem, have decided to kill Jesus. Uh, they're not going to put up with him anymore. But he's come to within two miles of Jerusalem to Bethany, where Lazarus lived, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. Here a dinner was given in Jesus' honour. Martha served while Lazarus was among those reclining at the table with him. Then Mary took about a pint of pure nard, an expensive perfume. She poured it on Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with her hair, and the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, who was later to betray him, objected. I was this perfume soul and the money given to the poor. It was worth a year's wages. He did not say this because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. As keeper of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put into it. Leave her alone, Jesus replied. It was intended that she should save this perfume for the day of my burial. You will always have the poor among you, but you will not always have me. Meanwhile, a large crowd of Jews found out that Jesus was there and came 
not only because of him, but also to see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. So the chief priests made plans to kill Lazarus as well, for on account of him, many of the Jews were going over to Jesus and putting their faith in him. And this is God's word for us this morning. May he bless the rich into our lives. We'll come back to it in a minute. We're going to sing Psalm 116. And uh, we'll sing their verses at the beginning and then at the end of the psalm. And it's really asking the question the psalm, God's done so much for me, how can I thank Him? Maybe that's Mary's question. The question in her mind when she thinks of Jesus, He's done so much, how can I thank Him? So Psalm 160, let's stand and sing. <laughs> Because 
We know, all of us, that just standing up, filling our lungs and making the right noises is not worship. And that all of us, God is looking to our hearts. He's looking at my heart, he's looking at your heart, because you know that there are times we can just, as we say, pay lip service. Uh, we can just say things in prayer and in praise that actually aren't in our hearts. And we can do that in all our relationships. We can say to people, oh, I love you, um, or um, I'm really thankful, or I'm really sorry. And actually, it's not in our heart, it's just in our lips. Uh, and actually, we don't love, or we're not thankful, and we're not sorry. Uh, so, God is always looking at the heart. And to be a Christian is to be concerned with your heart. It's to be concerned with what is in your heart. It's not just to be concerned with going through the motions and doing the right thing. Now you know that, uh, but it's good to be reminded and to be reminded many, many times. Uh, I need to be reminded because it's so easy to slip into formality as Christians where God is looking for our hearts. So. When we see this beautiful miracle, this beautiful act rather, of um, Mary, uh, where we, we see that she took about a pint of pure nard, of pure nard um, half a litre in uh, translation, an uh, expensive perfume, she poured it on Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with her hair, and the house is filled with the fragrance of the perfume. And I wonder if, from God's point of view, if this house is filled with the fragrance of the perfume of our praise and worship and our love for him this morning. And because God is sensitive to these things and these are the things that he sees. I don't know what it looks like to look at a congregation from God's point of view. Of course, I don't know that. But he's not going to look at it the way I'm looking at you with my eyes. How God looks at things. I think he, he looks at them from the bottom up almost and he perhaps sees everything from his very basic roots. So he knows this. And that is why uh, he desires, as Psalm 51 says, truth in the inner part of our lives. So the question A as we read this story is, you know, not could we do this? Like Mary, could we could we do something lavish for God? Uh, but what is in our hearts towards God? Not the outward act, but what is in the heart? Because lots of hearts are exposed in this story, and that's what we're going to look at today. Where, where are our hearts lying in this story? You may be familiar with the story. Uh, who, who do you identify with here? Do you identify with Judas Iscariot and the other disciples? What waste of money and it should have been used in a better way. Is their life uh, to identify with Mary? Mary uh, breaks that jar of ointment and she just keeps pouring it out until it's empty. Pours it out on Jesus. You identify with that, with that act of love. You identify with Jesus. You understand what he means when he says, and I'm not going to be here much longer for you to do this to me. That Jesus actually senses that he is worthy of this act of lavish extravagance for Mary. Who, who, who are you lying with there in the story? Where is your heart? Who do you think? I'm with her, around with him. Well, I want to explain a few things as we go into the story, just to help make, make the picture clear. Um, so, three things. First of all, how they were seated. So here's a picture of kind of like how they may have been seated. So if we imagine it's like Leonardo da Vinci's Last Supper, you know, when everyone sat at a table, that's just not how they sat. Uh, they sat around the tables. This was the custom in the Mediterranean world. Uh, they sat around a little table, or maybe no table at all. Maybe it was just all on the floor. And they faced each other. Uh, like spokes of a wheel around the centre, with their feet sticking out back, which is how Mary is able to access Jesus' feet so readily. 
to anoint Jesus. If you have a picture crawling under a table <laughs> to anoint Jesus' feet, it's just not like that. So this is the way that they, they suck. And then there is this nard, spike nard, this plant, <coughs> which uh, has a root from which people extract a very precious perfume or ointment. Now this plant, in, in, certainly in Jesus' day, was native to the Himalayas, to Nepal. So if Mary was to get this nard, it had to be imported along the silk route, along the camel trail, all the way from Nepal, thousands of miles away. So it was very expensive. Yeah, and it was difficult to extract, you know, a lot of it from the roots of the, of the, the plant, the spike nard plant. And so it was very precious stuff, this, this spike nard, that Mary used for the anointing. Good to know that as well. Yeah, and then another thing, and that is that this story in John's Gospel also appears in Matthew and in Mark's Gospel. And like often happens, uh, Matthew, Mark, and, and John, and Luke, when he's involved, you know, all tell it from eyewitness points of view, and of course eyewitnesses pick up different things. So you can compare them, uh, and we're not actually told who, who is involved uh, in the anointing in Matthew and Mark, it's just a woman, but John tells us because he's followed the story of Mary and her family, it was Mary. And, uh, we're told about the container in Matthew and Mark, an alabaster jar, so like a stone jar, which uh, the top would be broken off to, to pour out the, the ointment and the amount, you know, about a pound and a half a litre. Uh, we're told in Matthew and Mark that Mary anointed Jesus' head, and then Jesus speaks of being anointed there also in his body. But John focuses on the part of the body that. Uh, is Jesus' feet. So there's that, that sort of difference as well. And in the different Gospels, Judas Iscariot and John is the critic. Some of the disciples, or some present rather, in Mark, the disciples are the critics in Matthew. And then there's a few other things there as well. And so there's, it's interesting to compare them and to remember this uh, that is represented in three Gospels. Um, three perspectives, three to compare. But let's look at the hearts. And uh, we're going to start with the disciples. We'll look at Mary and we'll look at Jesus. The disciples. In the story, it wasn't the disciples who anointed Jesus, and it wasn't the disciples who approved of the anointing of Jesus. John tells us about Judas. Judas did not anoint Jesus and Judas did not approve of the anointing and the reason we're told about that is because in Judas' heart the place where Jesus should have been was already occupied and it was occupied by money. So the, the story here uh, tells us about Judas. Why wasn't this perfume sold and the money given to the poor it was worth a year's wages? So he's one of these people who thinks of everything in money terms, you know, what's it worth? I guess we're encouraged to do that all the time. Uh, if you watch any of these shows where, you know, like antiques are being valued, uh, where people are bringing stuff to the auction or whatever, what's it worth is the, is the question. And it's always money that seems to be the thing, of course, uh, where things can be worth a lot more in other terms, uh, like uh, because their mind is someone we loved or whatever. But this is Judas. What's it worth? So is that something that's in our hearts? Like, this is worth so much. You know, this is the financial value of this. The worth of doing this is what we get out of it in terms of wages. You know, is, that, is that a way that we think? This is Judas. And John tells us that Judas had been found out stealing, that he was helping himself to the common money bag. Whenever anyone gave something, to Jesus in the disciples. Judas kept it in the bag, except he helped himself to it. Uh, he wasn't just uh, someone who loved money, which is the root of all kinds of evil, Paul tells us. He was someone who was greedy and who stole money. 
So that's a challenge to our hearts straight away because money is a big thing, you know, it makes the world around, we're, we're told in the song. But it's a great uh, obstacle to us being full of Jesus. Because if it happens that in our hearts where Jesus should be, money is, then where's Jesus going to be in our hearts? And so we look at our own diagnosis of ourselves, things like the generous heart. Jesus calls for generals to give to the church, to give to, to people in need. Um, sacrificially, perhaps, how do we respond? Or even where honesty is concerned with money. This time of year we're beginning to think about filling our tax return. I know what the temptations are. Every time I make a journey for the church, I have to record my mileage. And, you know, you know, I could put 30 miles or 40 miles for a journey. If I put 40 miles, then I'll get about 20 pence worth of tax refund. Well, that's not that, so that's rubbish. 10 pence, I think it's worth it. Um, so you've got to be scrupulous about these things. If your heart's greedy, then it always falls on the side of you look making a little more. And government out of money to repair potholes and so on. How do we respond? Insurance claims. How do we respond? Anything that, that shows our attachment to money, you know. How do we respond when someone wins the lottery? Do we always shout at us? Or do we feel sorry for them? How do we respond? What's in our hearts? It wasn't just Judas who had an issue here, though. Because we're told about the other disciples. Uh, I remember Matthew tells us that they also were involved in criticizing Mary. Why this waste? He said. And they were told rebuke Mary harshly. Very strong word in Mark, Mark chapter 14 here. And from, and why was this why this waste of perfume can be sold for more than years' wages? The money given the poor. And they rebuked Mary harshly. Now, it's not like they were greedy in, in Judas' sense to steal the money for themselves. It wasn't that they wanted the money for themselves, just that they didn't want the money for Jesus. They saw better ways to spend it than on Jesus. And, you know, there's a challenge too. You know, do we actually understand there is no better way to spend your money than on Jesus? Mary seems to see something then that the disciples don't see. For all they've spent a lot longer with Jesus than Mary has, Mary seems to see what the disciples either haven't got to see yet, or maybe they've seen it and they've got so used to being with Jesus that they're not seeing it anymore. But is there more to Jesus? You know, is there a more to Jesus than you see at the moment? Like Jesus, Mary obviously sees something in Jesus the disciples don't. Because the disciples just can't understand what she's done. It's such a lavish and expensive and extravagant and generous act of the heart that they have shown. So what is she seeing that they're not seeing? And do we see as the disciples see? Or do we see as Mary sees? And there's more to see than Mary sees as well because Jesus tells us uh, for example, Mary probably hasn't really thought about Jesus' burial, but Jesus makes it seem like that's like, Mary, think about how this act is about my burial. So there's more even to see about Jesus and what, who he is and what he's going to do than Mary sees yet. And so on, more and more and more to see of Jesus, more and more reasons to love him, more and more reasons to adore him, more and more reasons to worship him, one more reasons to respect and be in awe of him. Do we see? Now Jesus says something you know, pretty uh, stark. A lot of people have criticized Jesus for saying this. Uh, people who are champions in their minds of the poor, I like the disciples, the disciples were in this moment, champions of the poor. You will always have the poor among you, Jesus says. But you will not always have me. But Jesus is a hand who is quoting from the Old Testament. Old Testament says the poor you will always have with you. 
Uh, Deuteronomy, I think it is. But you want all of a sudden Jesus is Jesus. No, do you understand that? Do you think Jesus is being egotistical there? Is he thinking too much for himself there? Well, we know that Jesus certainly did not disregard the poor. That you can't ever criticize Jesus for not loving and caring for the poor because it was the poor and the oppressed, the tax collectors and the sinners, and, uh, the people with no one to help them, that whom Jesus spent his time on and helped. So you can't criticize him for that. But is he saying, well, in this moment, this money is better spent than me? Is that him being you know, self centered? Is that him being uh, proud? Conceited? Or is it just a fact? There is no one like me, Jesus is saying. If only your disciples, even if only Mary would really see who is in your midst. If you could only understand who I really am, then would you lavish me with all that you have and call the world to do the same. So it's a question about how much we see that Jesus really is worthy of this. Mary sees it. Do we see it? And there's more to see, even if we do. Let's not congratulate ourselves and say, yeah, I do what Mary did. Because there's more. Jesus is worthy of more. And, you know, this is a fact. And we will see this. <clears throat> if we follow Jesus, he's going to lead us into far greater visions than we have of him just now. And we will know that we were always mean in our appraisals of him because he is far, far greater than we can possibly understand. And he is certainly worthy of this. So let's not let anything in our hearts get in the way of devotion, love to Jesus like the disciples did. Let me think about uh, maybe yourself. Uh, maybe it doesn't act that it's certainly not ordinary. It's not ordinary. It's, it's extraordinary because she thinks Jesus is extraordinary. And in Mark, uh, Mary's heart, there are, there are a few things. I mean, there's service, like Martha is serving here, and Mary is serving in a different way. Uh, Martha served as she did in Luke chapter 10. Uh, making and preparing and serving food and Mary is serving by anointing Jesus. Uh, they're both thankful because this dinner has been given in Jesus' honour it says there. They're both thankful. They're thankful uh, to Jesus and uh, it's like um, they're saying in their own ways um, thank you so much for raising my brother from the dead. And then there's love. Now, that's what we're going to focus on in Mary's heart. Uh, Mary's love wasn't a normal amount of love. Uh, and it wasn't normal uh, to anoint people who were alive like this either. It's quite an unusual act. So why did Mary do it? Uh, and we can think about that. Here's, here's Mark. Jesus says she did what she could. Now that's really interesting, isn't it? Because you might think, well, I don't know if I could do, do what Mary did. Maybe I could do better what Martha did. Yeah. Uh, you know, I don't know if I could serve in the way that the person over there does, but I can do it in the way I can. I can do what I could or can do. And that's encouraging. Yeah. And, you know, sometimes we can't do very much. Yeah. Maybe we've not much money, or maybe we're exhausted, or maybe we're... we're um, We've got brain fog, or we're, we're, we're sick, or you know, we're distracted, we're, we're anxious, we're depressed, whatever it is. There's lots of reasons why we can't do very much. But this is not Jesus in the same of give, we give a certain amount. You know, remember, he commends the widow for her two small copper coins when the rich are casting large amounts of money 
that aren't worth very much at all because they're not given with love. She did what she could. And then he says this, she poured perfume on my body beforehand and threw a prayer for my burial. And again, it may be that Martha doesn't, or Mary doesn't see them. And it may be that Jesus is simply saying, you know, I'm about to die and you need to think about that. And I'll understand what you've just done, Mary, in this beautiful way. You've anointed me for my burial. I'm going to die for your sins, but she, you know, maybe that's not all very clear to them at that point. Whatever, Jesus looks into Mary's heart and he finds what he calls a beautiful thing. She has done a beautiful thing to me. Now there are lots of beautiful things in the world. And I hope we can see them at this time of year. There's much that is very beautiful. Beautiful things have you seen in the last few days? Beautiful views. Sometimes it's the little things. I was out for a wee walk just at the back of Kyle here just before dinner yesterday, and uh, the views were amazing. But sometimes it's the little things, it's the little flowers, it's the little plants, it's the little insects. Beautiful things. Or at night, it's the stars. Whatever it is, there are beautiful things. And Mary's anointing of Jesus belongs with the beautiful things. Beautiful things. Jesus tells us in Mark's Gospel that what she has done will always be remembered, wherever the Gospel is preached. It's been remembered today. And here we are this morning, fulfilling Jesus' prophecy. Fulfilling Jesus' word. About Mary doing a beautiful thing. And this is love for Jesus that Mary is showing. But love for Jesus is love for God. We mustn't forget that. It's not like she loves Jesus, but you know, God is something else. If you love Jesus, you love God. Love the Lord your God with all your heart. Love Jesus. He is the image of the invisible God. Paul writes. So if you love Jesus, you're loving God. You may not understand that. You may not even see it clearly. Maybe Mary doesn't. But she's loving the living God. So, what is in our hearts today? Is her love? Is her love for God? Is her love for Jesus? Or are we too afraid of what other people think? Because other people have lots of opinions about me. Uh, I guess that although it's not mentioned, what she did might seem quite scandalous. It's very intimate. She's she's let down her hair. And she's using it to rub the ointment in to Jesus. Very, very intimate act. Could be quite scandalous in some people's eyes. In other people's eyes, it was wasteful. Some people just probably thought maybe it was daft. And uh, she certainly was out of tune with the, with the company. They didn't think it was proper, didn't fit their expectations. Do you love Jesus enough that it doesn't really matter what other people think about what you do for Jesus? Because it's what Jesus thinks that matters. And it's your love for Jesus that is going to show. And you're not going to let other people stop you from showing it. This is love that we're seeing here. And do we understand it? You know, are we there with Mary? Are we thinking to ourselves, you know, Mary, if only I could have been there with you, and I'd have been happy to make a contribution towards the cost or by my own alabaster jar, and I'd be there with you, pouring out my love to Jesus. Many things there are in the human heart, many things there are in society to snare our hearts, and to fill up our hearts, so that there's no room for the love of Jesus. But all that's in the world is passing away. None of it's going to be here for very long. All that we can set our hearts on, every object, every, you know, every thing of bricks and mortar, everything of, of accounts and, and of savings and everything of you know, possessions, and garden, and cars, whatever we have, it's just not going to be there for that long. And if our hearts are set, what are, what's going to be left when they're gone? in our hearts, what will be left in our hearts. 
Well, if you have love for Jesus, you're never going to lose that. It's never going to be taken away. So that's, that's the challenge of this beautiful episode of me. But finally, let's just think briefly about Jesus himself. Because what's in Jesus' heart? And again, it's lots of mysteries. We can't really look into hearts very, very well at all. And we know there's indignation. We see that because he's, well, the twelve are indignant with Mary. Jesus is indignant with the twelve at their meanness. Many other things, but most of all, of course, in Jesus' heart, there is also love. Love in the heart of Jesus, such a love. Such a love that Jesus is about to show you know, greater love is no one than this, than that a man lays down his life for his friends. And you are my friends, I'm going to lay down my life for you. Jesus is about to do that just in about seven days time he's about to do that he's going to lay down his, his life for these disciples for Mary and Martha and Lazarus for all those who believed in him through Lazarus is he raised from the dead and for all the scattered children of God throughout time and throughout the world he's going to lay down his life for our sins greater love well there is no greater love than the love of Jesus. So how are the disciples going to fare? Because they didn't see the love of Mary. They couldn't see it. Their hearts were so full of other things. They couldn't see the love of Mary. And if they can't see that love in Mary's heart, will they be able to see the love of Jesus in Gethsemane when he's arrested and tried and flogged? crucified for them. Now sometimes, you know, because of the clapping in our hearts, we can't see love. We maybe, we've maybe realized that in our own marriages, in our own relationships with our families. We've realized that in uh, relationships among other people, friends, workmates, neighbours, whatever. Sometimes our hearts are cluttered that when we're shown love or when we witness love, we can't see it. Maybe afterwards think, you know, actually, I missed that completely. I should have just stood back and enjoyed seeing the love because it's such a precious thing and it's maybe not there's not enough of it in the world. But we didn't see it. We missed it. Well, what is going to happen when Jesus dies? Are the disciples going to see the love? This is love. Paul describes it so richly, so simply actually. This is love. When we look around us, Let's not miss it when it happens. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It is not rude. It is not self seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. There was love in the heart of Mary that day, and it was perhaps the greatest act of love the disciples ever saw by anyone, apart from by Jesus himself. And they missed it. There was love in the heart of Jesus today. And can we see it? we see it. John writes again in his letter, we love him because he first loved us. Can we see that love? You know, if we're going to love Jesus, we're going to see his love for us first of all. Can we see that love? The love of Jesus. The love without measure. Something truly pure and beautiful. 
and rich and endless and without bounds. Can you see that love? Something that is complete and absolute, that never, never tires, never runs dry. The love of Christ. Can you see that love today? Is that love that captivated us? Is that love delighting us today? Is that love motivating us? So that we're not really at all concerned about money or about what people see, but we're just concerned that we get whatever opportunity we can to show that love of Jesus in our hearts back towards him, the love of Christ. Let's pray again. We ask your forgiveness, Lord, please, this week. Let your word search your hearts this morning. It's a challenging word because it really has exposed us, Father. We confess before you the lack of love in our hearts. And not only that, our blindness that we can't even see love when it happens. We can't even see the love of Jesus. We know it is portrayed to us all the time in the glory and in the beauty of the gospel story. So please, Lord, forgive us. Help us. Uh, to unclutter our hearts, to depend on all those things that get in the way of seeing your love. Help us, Lord, to see it and help us to mirror it. May that love that you have for us be in our hearts so that we may love with that love others and may love you also. Have mercy upon us. Amen. We're going to sing together and we're going to sing from him. The words that are okay. Let's start.
peace, may the grace, mercy, and love of God, from Father and Son and Holy Spirit, rest upon and remain with each one of you, now and always. Amen. Amen. God bless you this week. And come have a cup of tea in the hall if you can. And before you go, just say nothing for that. Bless you.